All right, guys, welcome back for another video. Today's video will be on the topic of the Ethereum merge. If you guys have been following any crypto news, you know that a little bit over 24 hours ago, the uh, Ethereum network successfully cl completed an Ethereum merge, uh, which is a big deal uh, for the network. I would go so far as to say it's the most important event to happen in crypto since the issuance of the Bitcoin white paper, which basically started the whole thing. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to go over. Um, I will talk about price action, but first I want to just talk about the underlying fundamentals of the Ethereum network that have, have now changed. Um, so we can go right here. You can see these net ETH emissions. You can see that already, like, um, you know, the, the ETH emissions are starting to decline dramatically uh, following the, uh, the merge. So th that's what is essentially creating a deflationary uh, ecosystem within Ethereum, right? Prior to the merge, you had much, much more sell pressure coming from the uh, Ethereum miners who were using, you know, the proof of work system to uh, validate the network. Uh, and now that the, the network has moved over to using validators to validate the transactions, the supply issued to the validators is much less than the supply that was rewarded to the uh, Ethereum miners previously. And so the ratio you really want to look at is the ratio between the Ethereum issued to validators and the Ethereum burned via gas fees on the network, right? If the amount of gas fees is burned, you know, using Ethereum, which essentially represents Ethereum demand, right? Ethereum demand is represented by gas fee usage. If that gas fee usage is greater than the supply issued to validators, then the network can be said to be deflationary. And I, I think uh, that I think ultimately that's what we will see in the network. Um, now, also uh, following the uh, the merge, this is Ethereum uh, inflow into exchanges. Which, if you've been following any of my previous videos, you know how important this is, right? If if you ever see a spike of um, any coin, you know, flowing into an exchange, that is a major, major, major uh, signal that there's about to be massive sell pressure, uh, at least in the short term, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have any bearing over the long term, but in the short term, it's something you want to keep on your radar. If you have some access to Glassnode data to, you know, to alert you to that inflow, you know, you want to pay attention to that because it will, it will, um, have a very dramatic effect to the downside and you want to manage risk, right? Uh, so who knows why uh, all these exchange inflows came uh, following, you know, the merge. I, I don't know. I mean, we can make up a lot of different reasons, um, but all we know is that it did, right? And that the effect is that, you know, it has a short term of downward effect on price. So we can go back to the price chart and kind of look at the, uh, you know, You've got your uh, FUSD chart, and you can see that, yeah, the coins hitting the exchanges did, you know, I think the merge uh, finalized right here, and then it, you know, pushed lower uh, below below that level. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the FUSD chart, you know, is not something I pay too much attention to just because, uh, you know, really, you know, it's going to do what Bitcoin's going to do. In a sense, maybe you think Ethereum is going to lead. Uh, that's fair, actually. Ethereum has led uh, pretty pretty significantly in the past, um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, they're generally going to do the same thing, right? And it's generally going to have to do with what the dollar is doing, right? If you look at the USD and the Bitcoin USD, they're both going to trade against uh, dollar liquidity, right? So if dollar based liquidity goes up, then the Bitcoin uh, USD pairings and ETH USD pairings are going to go up too. So they're going to be highly correlated in that sense. It do, I don't think it really matters to say who's correlated to who or who leads because, you know, Ethereum has definitely led. I don't think that really matters. What we want to know is the relationship between the two, right? And, and how to arbitrage that relationship. Uh, so for me personally, I think the FBTC chart is the most important chart, uh, you know, in, in crypto really, uh, also, just the most important chart uh, for all coins, right? Um, I, I look at the Ethereum Bitcoin chart 
as the uh, the altcoin index, so to speak. So, you know, Ethereum is obviously the most important altcoin um, by by a long shot, but also a lot of the other altcoins that are also valuable are based on the Ethereum ecosystem. So, in a lot of ways, the Ethereum protocol is the altcoin protocol, right? So the Ethereum Bitcoin chart shows you altcoin strength. And, and, you know, when it, when it, when it does put in a technical uh, signal that is bullish or bearish, right? That's, I'm going to interpret that as a bullish sign for altcoins or bearish, you know, based on whatever the uh, signal is. Now, what's interesting here is that we have a major, major, major fundamental bullish factor happening for Ethereum in the merge, right? So you've got, um, and really the best trades are when, uh, you know, the, the uh, fundamentals line up with the technicals, right? So we have a situation right now where, you know, the fundamentals are extremely bullish. Um, it, it couldn't get more bullish, right? And going back to the deflationary schedule we talked about, just more and more supply will be burned for Ethereum and demand will probably go up. So again, markets are just supply and demand over time that will cause price to go up and it can cause it to go up very dramatically and parabolically. But again, that, that process takes a lot of time. Um, and this really isn't the, uh, the ideal setup uh, from a technical perspective on the Ethereum Bitcoin chart. I mean, this is a chart... Um, you know, where you, you've got a pretty aggressive move off this base right here. And then, uh, you know, creating this inefficiency right here. And then you're getting a, a little bit of a price pause here. And then price is slowing down a little bit. Um, and you can see that in the RSI, right? Um, you know, starting to lose the moving averages. And if you went down to a four hour, I'm sure you'd see, you know, the moving averages starting to turn around in, in that sense too. Um, now, if we go to the weekly chart, you can see that, uh, pull this. You can see that, uh, you know, the weekly has uh, confirmed uh, bearish divergence right here. So, you know, creating a higher high relative to this high and then taking out uh, last week's high. Remember, we, we don't have bearish divergence until, you know, you confirm a top right there, but you uh, confirm that area right there. You have bullish divergence confirmed, about to lose the RSI. So, <clears throat> you know, it's not the most bullish uh, chart technically, right? Uh, so, you know, it, and, and fundamentals do take a long time to play out. So you could see uh, a retrace of this price swing on the FBTC chart. And again, please don't interpret this to mean that this has to happen, right? I mean, Ethereum could just, it, BTC could just continue and, and go onwards and upwards. But uh, I do think that the, the retrace scenario is pretty likely. Um, and if that did happen, uh, you would expect this inefficiency to get filled here and to find some type of reaction off this uh, 0.05888 level right there. Now, it's one level at a time. You could mark off the base of this uh, price support right here. I'll just mark off every distinction just for the sake of being thorough. See, because you see price move aggressively uh, through this void and then start to stall there. Right, it stalls here, breaks above, comes back, tests off that level, breaks above, comes back, tests off that level. So this is going to be a level here. Uh, you also have a level coming in right here. So price comes up, tests off that level, comes down, comes back above, breaks above it, tests down, rallies up, comes down, tests off, comes up, tests down. So roughly, you know, there are multiple levels that price would have to get to and react off before it ultimately tests down. But this area down here would, from a risk reward perspective, represents the ideal uh, area that I would be looking to take along on Ethereum BTC. Um, again, there, it's not the only position to take a long position, but that would, in my mind, be really the ideal position. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited to take trades where the fundamentals and the technicals line up, right? And I know a lot of people watching videos are purely technical traders, um, and that's fine. I mean, I'm a price action trader at heart, but, uh, you know, 
when the fundamentals align, you know, those make the best trades. Um, a good example of that is like if you, you know, these big fundamental shifts in the market, if you'd identified that, you know, what was happening in Europe with Russia and the energy trade and you, you know, during the Ukraine war had said, okay, you know, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to get long energy. We'll just go to uh, crude oil. If you had said, I'm going to get long energy because I know the knock on effects that this is going to have, then that would have been a, a great trade. And maybe we can go and see, you know, mark off the invasion of uh, Ukraine on the chart. But let's see, we got, yeah, so roughly in February of this year, you had the invasion and then you had a, a parabolic move up then a little bit of a distribution and then move down. So again, it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, I would still be bullish on, on, uh, oil right here. Um, you know, you got, you got this move up and then you get a sell off, but really the, the impact this is going to have is, is going to lower the CPI data that comes in because a lot of the CPI data is based very heavily off oil, uh, oil prices. So I think we'll see a lot of the CPI data coming in, uh, come in much lower. Uh, but going back to Ethereum, uh, one thing I re really want to talk about with Ethereum is the bond market. And, uh, you know, really Ethereum is, in, in its shift to proof of stake, it has solidified itself as a, uh, as a very, very uh, heavily demanded system by institutions right and in these large institutions like jp morgan uh you know goldman sachs morgan stanley those guys understand um you know centralized systems like proof of stake and they also understand bond yields and they also have a demand for the esg narrative now those are all three separate ideas so i'll have to unpack them each one by one but uh basically you know one going to the bond yield, right? You you have the U.S. Treasury yielding, uh, let's see, uh, roughly I think three point five. So we'll go there and check and see if it's still at three point five. So the U.S. Treasury ten yield, yeah, it's three point four seven. Uh, so on your U.S. Treasury ten year ten year yield, you got uh, three point four seven. Now the yield curve is inverted, so if you were to go to like a two year, it would be even higher. So. Yeah, so your your two year is at three point nine, which is crazy. I mean, it's yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, but the the point is, is that the Ethereum yield is is actually far more dramatic than the uh, than the yield you get in the bond market by orders of magnitude. You know, three three times as uh, as large, and that's really going to draw people into the uh, bond market. Uh, these investors, you know, because you can bridge the that the the differential between the yields is the bridge the positive funding bridge that they can capture in arbitrage right so you can go long to your government bonds and you know uh, also excuse me you can borrow to your government bonds and then go long uh, ethereum stake the ethereum capture the yield hedge your currency risk in the cash settled futures market. And that's your positive carry trade. And I did a whole video on the positive carry trade, so I won't go into it, but I will just talk about the highlights. What makes it unique is that assuming that Ethereum, you know, enters a bull market uh, following the uh, merge, just based on the uh, underlying supply factors, you know, again, not, not immediately, but over time you'd expect those, it's like a Bitcoin halving, right? You know, you'd expect a Bitcoin halving to initiate a bull market. Well, same, same concept here with the Ethereum uh, supply schedule changing, uh, even, just even more dramatically. When that does happen, then the futures curve, which is now in backwardation, meaning that the futures price is trading below the spot price, will actually reverse and futures will start trading at a premium and a significant premium that scales with the strength of the bull market. And what that does is it allows these, in, you know, these bond investors who are putting on the positive carry trade 
arbitraging the cost of capital in the fiat markets versus the yield in the Ethereum market to hedge their currency risk in the cash settled futures market and also capture the premium uh, within the cash settled futures market, which is a whole different ballgame because generally when you're doing a positive carry trade in the fiat markets, you know, you, you, you have to, that hedging your currency risk cuts into your return. It costs a lot of money to do that. So the opportunity to make a ton of money hedging your currency risk in Ethereum in a bull market is totally different and uh, extremely unusual. And that alone will bring in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, institutional investors, particularly because, you know, just the bond market is bond investors are backed into a corner. Uh, it's very difficult to make a good return there. They've just, you know, the vultures have picked out all the capital in that market. And also, you know, there's also the ESG narrative, uh, you know, uh, whatever you think about the ESG narrative, um, you know, it, it is very popular and there's a lot of money behind it. So, you know, these people feel very strongly about, you know, environmental concerns and they're willing, when people feel that strongly about something, they're willing to spend a ton of money towards it. Just look at all the, uh, you know, the, the churches that were built in the ancient times in Europe, right? People threw ungodly amounts of money at those churches. And, you know, in a way, a lot of environmental, I'm not saying, I'm not diminishing them, but people, their environmental concerns have elevated to the level of a religious belief, right? And the amount of money people will throw at their religious beliefs is unbelievable. And these guys on Wall Street, you know, they're, they're the priests of ESG. They're willing to, you know, take the money of the pious and fill their own pockets, right? Whether or not it actually helps the environment. And uh, Ethereum, with its switch to proof of stake, uh, now has a very, very compelling case that can be made to ESG investors uh, to, to bring that ESG capital into the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, so that'll be a huge marketing campaign. And I really expect that to bring in a lot of capital, along with the, uh, you know, intrinsic uh, capital motivations of bond investors. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys like this video. If you do just like,